Ah, good morning, everyone. Glad to have you here today. I, I'm so excited. We've got so many people in this room, and for the most part, everyone did want to sit up front, except for these two seats. I've got two lovely seats up here in the front. Anyone wants to come on down? I actually took a shower today. I put on deodorant. Come on down <laughs> and join us here in the front row. So welcome to our session today, where we're going to talk about uh, Red Hat Satellite and Ansible better together. My name is Chris Wells. I'm the product owner for Red Hat Satellite, and I'm joined today by... Justin Emmers, product owner for Ansible and Ansible Tower. And one of the things that you might be asking yourself is, what is a product owner, and why do you have these two product owners talking to you today? Uh, briefly speaking, product owners, we are, think of us as like general managers. We are responsible for running the businesses for both Satellite and Ansible, respectively. At Red Hat, that means we do everything from working with our engineering and product management teams, on product strategy, all the way through building of the product, working with our QE teams, documentation, all the way through selling with our sales teams, our solution architects, consultants to delivery in the field, support, anybody and everybody who touches the business ultimately we're working with to really deliver to our customers the best experience possible. So overall, I run it for the satellite side and Justin runs it for uh, the Ansible side. So let's take a look here at the, uh, the agenda and talk a little bit about what we're gonna talk about here today. Going to spend a few minutes talking about just Red Hat management overall and where the different products that we represent fit into the overall Red Hat management strategy moving forward. Then we'll talk a little bit about the respective products. Justin will talk a little bit about Ansible. I'll talk about uh, Satellite. And then we're really going to talk about use cases of putting both of these together, how you can take both Satellite and Ansible in your environments. What are the common use cases? How can you make them work better together? And we're not just going to tell you about that, but we're actually going to demo that. And actually, Justin's going to talk a little bit about our demo for a moment. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we'll, we're going to get into more details in a bit about exactly what it is that we're demoing. But first, what I want to do is actually get something started. So Ansible ultimately is an automation platform, so we're going to automate the build um, of on infrastructure that was deployed via satellite, we're gonna go ahead and automate uh, a web stack um, that uses Java, um, some more Linux packages from, from again, satellite, um, a load balancer, and a database server. So we're gonna, it takes about you know, 15 to 17 minutes to, to get rolling. So we're just gonna go ahead and fire this sucker off, make sure I get the right one. It's gonna ask me a couple of questions. We'll pick uh, version one of this app, and we'll go ahead and launch. So now that that's going, and later on, when we actually get to the demonstration section, we'll explain to you a little bit more in depth about what we're actually doing here with both Satellite and Ansible. But kind of in the uh, spirit of the conversation that we had the, uh, this morning at the keynote with a gentleman from Target talked about looking for doers. We actually want to make sure they're actually doing something here in the demonstration. And as Justin talked about, it takes about 15 or 20 minutes for the first part of the demo to run. We'll explain it to you more about how Ansible or Satellite are working together to build out an environment. And then we've got several other use cases that we'll walk through about how we can then update and manipulate that environment over time. Awesome. So the first thing that I think is important to discuss real quick is that Red Hat has really uh, an intense and renewed focus on management in general. So many of you, you're here, you're clearly familiar with Satellite. Uh, you might very well be familiar with Ansible and Ansible Tower. It's been in the news a lot lately with the acquisition of Ansible by Red Hat. Um, but fundamentally, we understand that um, there are a number of different factors that come into your digital transformation efforts. Um, we, as Red Hat Management, are specifically focused on the operational component of this. And the fact is that operations has changed. You know, the reality is you can no longer chase um, a single platform. Um, the next IT is never static. So what you're doing today is probably not going to be the right answer as your requirements change and your demands and, and the things you need to do in your environment change. Furthermore, collaboration is a new requirement. The reality is that uh, whether or not you're looking at DevOps initiative, um, your teams need to work more closely together and they need to be able to more effectively communicate what it is that they're doing. Uh, security is also non-negotiable. You need to find ways to tie all of this together and make sure that security is actually integrated into the whole entire process. Uh, the platform is hybrid, so you know you might be on bare metal today or some vert platform, maybe a cloud. Uh, you might you know, have multiple clouds. You probably will if you don't already. You might have some container infrastructure. The, the point is that uh, you cannot plan for a single static environment anymore. You need to make these things fluid. You need to make them dynamic, and Red Hat management is, uh, is here to do that for you. But ultimately, what we seek to do is effectively change and otherwise transform how you actually do operations. You know, everyone's talking DevOps, and, and that's great, and that's fine and dandy, but you know, a lot of people are forgetting that ops is a significant piece of DevOps. So it's not just about developer tools. It's not just about de uh, developer focus and developer initiative. 
it's about altering the, uh, the operational focus and, and providing a, a really valuable path forward from an operations perspective as well. So to do this, again, we have um, really three products and one service that we offer. Uh, again, most of you are likely familiar with Satellite. It's, uh, it's been around at Red Hat for quite some time. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm actually a rebounder, or a, a, a boomerang Boomeranger. from Red Hat. Before the acquisition, I worked at Red Hat. Uh, so Chris and I knew each other quite well back then because I sold a ton of Satellite uh, and deployed a ton of Satellite. Which I still don't know why we let him back in the company. I really, I really <laughs> don't right. know why. <laughs> That's right. Um, and then, of course, Cloud Forms, from a cloud management perspective, allows you to more effectively operationalize and, uh, and access and deploy and otherwise manage uh, your overall hybrid environments. Uh, Ansible, of course, is the automation framework that allows all of this to be simple, uh, allows all your teams to kind of use the same language to communicate, and we'll talk more about, uh, about the specifics of that. Uh, and then we have the service Insights, and I think the most brilliant thing that I can say about Insights is it, um, it allows you to fix things in your environment before they actually become problems. Uh, so just a real quick noodle on that is that, I mean, think about all of the massive amounts of data that the Red Hat support team has. Uh, they can effectively get to the granularity to say, oh, if you have this server with this RAID card that has this firmware and you're running this exact kernel version, it will panic in 162 days of uptime. It can be that granular, and that's amazing and powerful because that means that you don't have a production outage that you then have to run around and, and figure out how to solve. You can fix these problems before they're an issue. So that's the service that Insights provides. So before we go on here, I'm just kind of curious if we take a survey of the audience out here. Uh, raise your hand if you're a satellite customer today. Satellite customer, satellite user? Oh, <laughs> quite a few. That's good. Yeah. Uh, how about on the cloud form side? All right, some of our other management tools. How about Ansible? All right, pretty good numbers there. And anyone taking a look at Insights yet? OK, good, good. So now, let's just get the elephant in the room out. And in fact, this is actually a bull elephant, so Ansible. And I'm imagining because we've got a lot of satellite customers in here, we've got a lot of Ansible customers and users in here that probably last year when, when Red Hat did the acquisition of Ansible, probably a lot of you are going, well, that's interesting. <laughs> that's really kind of interesting because, you know, we've got satellite that's got some configuration management capabilities that we productize uh, from the public community. And then, of course, we, we bring on Ansible, and they've got configuration management as well as automation type of capabilities. How many of you, if you raise your hand, thought, well, that's kind of interesting? Yeah, yeah. That's been my life for the last, like, six months, you know, <laughs> answering that question for people. Like, what are you guys going to do with this? What kind, what's your strategy moving forward? How are you going to bring these products together? And the big thing that we'll want you to take out of this message more than anything else is that what you'll see here is this is very much a choice strategy, and it's very much an and strategy, meaning it's, we're going to show you how you can take these products and work with them together. It's very much satellite and Ansible and how they can work together. It's not a matter of, of the two of them trying to compete internally. Yeah, there's some overlap. There's things that they can do the same, but we really want to stress more of how you work with them together to deliver the, the best possible experience because each one has their own strengths that they bring to the table, and I think some of the use cases we'll talk about are very common when we talk with customers about how you want to be able to use the two of them together. So we just want to go ahead and, and get that out there. We know that's been a lot of questions. How are you guys going to make these two different solutions work together? And I think what you'll see by the end of this is the good news is there's some really cool stuff you can do from a use case perspective when you leverage both your satellite infrastructure and your Ansible infrastructure. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. So with that, let's talk a little bit about Ansible. So first and foremost, what is Ansible? Well, it's really three things. So first, it's the a simple automation language that allows you to perfectly describe uh, entire IT environments. So from the network all the way up to perhaps a higher level load balancer, everything in between uh, in a multi-platform and, and hybrid way. Uh, second to that, it's also the underlying engine. So we define that actually as a thing called a playbook. Um, then Ansible is also the underlying engine that interprets or runs those playbooks in your environment. Uh, so we don't sell Ansible. We don't sell Ansible playbooks or Ansible roles. Uh, what we sell is a thing called Ansible Tower. Ansible Tower is the way to really operationalize the use of Ansible in your environment. So Ansible Tower uh, really is a, a broad API that allows you to have a single point of interface to all of your other infrastructure underneath the covers, gives you control, gives you knowledge, gives you delegation, uh, and I'll go into that in a bit more. Um, Ansible out of the gates, the, the open source project, uh, the thing that you write uh, playbooks in and run from the command line, uh, is just really, really popular. And the adoption is soaring, and everyone that typically uses it loves it. And the reasons are because it's, it's at once simple. Um, and simple is important because the reality is you have a massive amount of work on your plates. Uh, the, the amount of things that are required of you are not going down, and so the time that you have to invest in learning new tools is not very great. 
Uh, so the simpler something is, the more readily you can start to use it and the more readily you can actually be functional with it very quickly. But it's also important because if you start to think about how all of these different teams that you're interfacing with, whether they're development, whether they're operations, um, you know, perhaps they're database, there could be network, you know, all of these other teams, you know, they might not be shell scripters. They might not know how to write uh, you know, in some higher level programming language, but they could probably figure out how to write an Ansible playbook. So the simplicity is important because it now suddenly allows you to, uh, to open up this automation platform to teams before that were totally isolated. Uh, a good example of that would be you know, networking, for instance. Uh, so the simplicity is great because it means that everyone can kind of participate in the automation community. Um, the second thing is power, right? It's extraordinarily powerful. Uh, simplicity is great, but if you can't do hard things, then it doesn't really, doesn't really help you out. So uh, Ansible is certainly a whole lot more than just config management. Um, really functionally, we're an app deployment or orchestration workflow tool. Uh, and we can do things like configure, uh, configuration management, um, but ultimately we can orchestrate the deployment of not just the whole entire application lifecycle, again, from a hybrid point of view, but then we use those same descriptions to actually allow you to redeploy them, modify them, pull additional content from, from satellite, uh, and generally make sure that everything that you're doing in your environment is highly repeatable. Uh, and then we do that all from an agentless fa uh, fashion. So whether you are um, Windows or Linux or Unix or network devices or inter Internet of Things, whatever it happens to be, uh, we are connecting to these things using APIs. We're connecting to them using SSH and WinRM, which you are likely already using in your environment. So we're not adding any additional firewall ports you have to open. We're piggybacking on the, on the stuff that you're already doing. So um, that's all great, but the challenge in question ends up being, well, how do I actually operationalize that in my environment? And that answer is Ansible Tower. So uh, Ansible Tower really provides no benefit on its own unless you actually are, are a big Ansible user. But the cool thing about this is once you bring an Ansible Tower into your environment, you suddenly gain the ability to start to give people access to the automations that your teams are doing in a completely controllable manner. Uh, which means that you can delegate access to certain teams to say, yes, you can do this or you can do that or you can uh, deploy this app here but not there. Uh, and then effectively audit and understand how everything is running in your environment from an automa automation perspective uh, and simultaneously know exactly you know, who changed what or what job they ran, what playbook it was, how many servers it touched, what the output of each of those servers were and so forth. So you get a lot of the information from the command line of Ansible, but the challenge with the command line, as we all know, is that it requires you, well, to know how to operate on the command line, but it also means that, um, that really anyone that could access that box, if they have a credential to log into another machine and they have a playbook, they could potentially manage another machine. Uh, Ansible Tower effectively operationalizes that and allows entire teams to kind of rally around, uh, rally around Ansible within, um, within their environment. And so finally, the one little thing I want to talk about, I've actually got just two more slides real quick. Uh, so we talk about Ansible as being, Ansible as being the language of DevOps. Uh, and what does that mean? Well, again, to point back on an earlier statement I made, uh, the simplicity of Ansible means that entire teams can kind of coalesce around a single language and a single tool that allows them to describe what it is that they do. And a common problem that many organizations have is that um, if not everyone is able to use the same tool or not everyone is able to understand the same tool, uh, you can still end up with a lot of operational constraints as you try to progress an application stack through a life cycle. Uh, and so one thing that we see pretty commonly is this concept of a deployment guide where folks are writing an application, but the problem is they're writing this application on systems that maybe don't particularly mimic or mirror exactly what you would have in a QA or a production environment. So ultimately the deployment guide doesn't really work. You get to 100, page 159 of it and it fails and it causes all of these, these kind of gnarly issues in the environment. Functionally, um, the reason that happens is because the mere idea of a deployment guide assumes uh, a ton of information. Um, it assumes that the person who wrote it it has the same skill level as the person that is deploying it. It assumes that the person uh, who is deploying it into an environment has an environment that is reasonably similar, if not identical to the environment that it was actually developed in. So it makes a lot of assumptions. And as you kind of go up the value chain of all of the different teams that are interacting with these application deployments, you can see pretty clearly and pretty quickly that you know, there, there are tons of balls up in the air and it's, it's no wonder they end up dropping. Uh, and so ultimately what Ansible does in this particular case is it allows everyone to use the same language to describe exactly what it is that they're doing. So when development is, is writing 
a new application. Uh, they're taking that application, they're describing how to deploy it, uh, and whether that means that they're using us for config management or they're using Puppet or, or Chef or whoever for config management um, doesn't really matter to us. We're orchestrating the deployment of that application and we're doing that on a system that was defined by the operations folks that the dev test can deploy in really any environment they want. So the dev test folks get a system that looks right and an environment that looks right and acts right. Um, and so they can test these things and they understand that if it works and ultimately everyone has buy-in and you see this, this immense value kind of up the, uh, up the entire chain. And then so finally, just a quick, quick little note on use cases. I imagine that most of you probably already know this, um, but functionally, um, we see a lot of folks that are using Ansible to modernize how they're actually doing operations in their environment. Uh, even when you take existing processes uh, and you begin to automate those existing processes, you can begin to manage your legacy like DevOps. Uh, and if you have a little accordion fold out, um, we've got a talk I think on Thursday midday uh, where I'm talking specifically about that. Um, next, we see migration. So once you've defined something in one environment, it becomes kind of easy to move it to another environment. Uh, so they're using Ansible to do that. Um, and then ultimately, once you've started to define all of these different pieces in your environment, you can start to uh, initiate a lot of DevOps type processes and DevOps type flows in your environment to, uh, to just further streamline your overall process. So that's Ansible and ready to hand it back to, uh, to Chris. Well, the good news is when I asked the uh, survey, about 75% of you put your hands up about satellites, so thank you for all <laughs> being a satellite customer. For those 25%, well, we need to have a conversation. We need to get on the boat here. But I'll take a few minutes here and just give for, those, uh, for that 25% that is not familiar with satellite or not currently a satellite customer, just a, a quick overview of it to, to level set everything. Uh, when we take a look at satellites, satellites are our overall systems management solution at Red Hat for managing all your content, being able to provision out your systems, managing the life cycle of those environments. Uh, traditionally, uh, for those of you that are Satellite 5 customers, we've primarily focused on managing Red Hat Enterprise Linux. With the release of Satellite 6 several years ago, we really started to change the amount of content, the types of content that we could bring into Satellite, and really expanded the types of systems that we're managing. So not, being able, not only being able to manage Red Hat Enterprise Linux, but being able to manage other types of layered products or RPM-based distributions that are on top of those as well, things such as our storage products, uh, Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization, uh, RHEL OSP, even some of the middleware products that are packaged up as RPMs. Those are all things that you can download into Satellite today to synchronize the content and then be able to manage the life cycle of those systems as you move them from uh, your development systems to your testing QA ultimately uh, into production and manage that, that life cycle. And of course, being able to manage that across a wide, uh, wide variety of platforms, whether you're trying to put those onto physical infrastructure, different types of virtualization infrastructures, private clouds, public clouds, uh, the idea with Satellite is we want to give you one place to be able to manage all your Red Hat infrastructure, all your Red Hat con uh, content across those multiple platforms, and then really be able to manage the different life cycles across that. And when I say life cycle, that's everything from being able to do the initial build of the system, so the initial provisioning, whether you want to do that build-based or image-based, then being able to uh, do the configuration of those systems when you're first standing them up, as long as the as long as once they're, they're running, being able to do drift detection and stuff to configure those systems. And of course, being able to manage the software, being able to patch them over time. So when events like you know, heart bleed or shell shock or drown happen, you've got that notification instantly from Red Hat through your satellite server that those systems need to be updated. You've got all the information and the packages to be able to do it. And then you've got, of course, you've got a process through satellite to be able to go through and update those systems. That's one of the examples that we'll talk about is how you can put those two things together between Ansible and satellite to make that experience uh, even faster and easier uh, to do. And of course, the last part of this is being able to track all your Red Hat subscriptions uh, that are inside the environment that you've purchased from Red Hat, how to manage those over time, being able to do report and audit. What I've seen with Satellite, and I've been with Red Hat for eight years, is that when I started back with Satellite eight years ago, a lot of the focus was really on the patch management side. Hey, I need to deploy a new system, I need to update a system. What I've really seen change over the last years is you've got to be able to do all those things along with the, the configuration and the management of subscriptions, but probably the biggest driver for most people has been security and compliance. So whether it's not, not only making sure that security updates are done, but then also for both internal and external auditors, being able to show that a set of systems is compliant uh, for both internal and external reasons, that's probably the biggest driver of satellite use cases that I've seen over the last few years. When we take a look at Satellite 6 in particular, because again, we rolled that out, Several years ago, one of the big decisions and one of the big things that we were trying to do behind Satellite 6 was really to expand the reach of Satellite to go across multiple different types of uh, platforms, 
uh, as well as being able to go across uh, different types of software content. When we start talking about things like containers, being able to move beyond RPMs and actually being able to start to uh, manage and have a place to store containers and manage containers on an ongoing basis. Those are the starts of things that you're starting to see inside of satellite, working with things like the, the drift detection, the configuration management, and a lot of emphasis on scale. I mean, for those of you that have taken a look at a Satellite 5 topology versus a Satellite 6 topology, you see that they're very different because Satellite 5 was really designed to have one master satellite. You put everything into that master satellite, and once you filled that thing up, you were done, and you deployed a second satellite. Whereas with Satellite 6, it's a much more of a scale-out type of architecture where you have the central satellite as kind of the brains of the organization, but then you can deploy out multiple capsules to really federate your content, federate the amount of uh, provisioning actions and other kinds of things in the environment. And one of those reasons that we made that huge change to go from Satellite 5 to Satellite 6 was to look things like it's scaling, because we know the world's changed. People need to be able to federate and scale out. So we really had to update the underlying architecture to do that. Of course, to be able to go out and build a new satellite, when we deployed Satellite 6, for those of you that have taken a look at it, you've noticed that Satellite 6, underneath the hood, very different from Satellite 5. <laughs> completely different code bases, completely different upstream projects. And when you take a look at the upstream projects that we use for Satellite 6, being built off of Foreman, uh, for the provisioning side, Catella for the content management, Puppet for configuration management, Pulp for the, uh, uh, the underlying content storage and stuff, you know, these are you know, more modern, more scalable, new projects to work with. When we did this design work several years ago for Satellite 6, one of the things that we clearly heard from customers is that we needed to have a better solution for being able to do configuration management, especially relative to what was available in Satellite 5. If you go back in the time machine and you take a look several years ago, uh, the number one project that people were using to manage configuration was Puppet. And so that's why we decided to uh, encapsulate and put Puppet inside of Satellite. But we've just uh, heard Justin talk about using Ansible. Ansible can be used for uh, configuration, but also it's being used for automation, orchestration types of tasks. So that kind of leads to the obvious question. Whoops. Obvious question, how do you make these two things work together? How do you have both the Puppet piece? How do you have the Ansible piece? Can you make these two things work together? What in the world are you guys thinking up there? And the answer is yes, you can make these two things work together. And that's what we want to show you is how you're going to get the best of both worlds out of this. So when you take a look at satellite today in both uh, version 6.1, which is the current shipping version, and 6.2, which will be coming out uh, in a little over a, a month or so, if you take a look at the current versions, everything that we do uh, today is around Puppet. So we actually ship the Puppet bits that we get from the open source community. We take those upstream, productize those into satellite today. And what you can do is if you want to deploy satellite into your environment, you're going to receive those bits and you have your choice. You can either use the puppet bits that come with satellite to manage your configuration of the systems and such, or if you have an external version of puppet because you've either downloaded your own version of puppet from the community that you've set up your own puppet infrastructure, or if you have a puppet enterprise subscription from Puppet Labs, we'll work with either one of those. It's really kind of your choice. If you want to use the puppet we provide, you want to use the puppet from the open source community because maybe you've got non-Red Hat systems that you want to manage or you want to bring in a puppet enterprise subscription as well, all of those will work. And that's what Satellite does today. Moving forward, what we're going to be doing is in addition to what we offer today for Puppet, none of that will change. We're not getting rid of Puppet. Puppet will stay the way that it is, but we're going to give you the choice to bring an Ansible. Because one of the things that we've seen over the last uh, couple of years, and Justin can testify, testify to this, is there's been a huge explosion and growth of people that want to use Ansible for all the reasons that Justin talked about. And so our goal from the satellite team's perspective is we want to give you choice. If Puppet is your choice because you have a lot of investment, because you've created Puppet modules, you've got the Puppet infrastructure, you've got Puppet knowledge, you will have that. We're not going to get rid of that from the satellite side. You'll be able to continue to do that and do it in the ways that we've, you do it today. If you decide, you know what, I haven't made a choice in regards to how I want to configure my systems and I want to be able to use Ansible, then moving forward in a future version of Satellite, we're going to add in support for Ansible inside of Satellite, as well as integration into Ansible Tower. And in fact, what's, what, what I've seen that's been pretty interesting is we get a lot of people that actually want to do both. But they'll say, you know what, I want to leverage Puppet for what Puppet's really good at from the configuration management side. I want to leverage Satellite for what it's really good for from the content management and provisioning side, and I want to bring in the Ansible side because Ansible is really good at the orchestration and automation. More than anything else, what we'd like you to really take away from this, and we'll demo demonstrate it here, 
is this is not an or choice. It really is an and choice. It's really, you can use all these tools successfully together. You don't have to pick one or the other. You pick what really is the right tool for the right job, and there's nothing wrong with mixing them together. From the satellite perspective, we'll continue to support both. We'll continue to sit both the Puppet stuff, and we'll continue, and then we'll add in the Ansible stuff as well. I think probably the best way to do that is not just to talk about it, but in the spirit of what we, show, show, what we heard this morning, let's be a doer. Let's actually see how this stuff actually works together. So let's talk about our use cases and our demo uh, that Justin kicked off a little bit earlier and see how that actually runs. So this, <laughs> this first particular use case that we'll talk about we see is fairly common in a lot of organizations where you've got infrastructure teams and you've got application teams. And I'd be curious by a show of hands, how many people would consider yourselves a member of that infrastructure team? Yeah, that's kind of what I expected. <laughs> And that's good. And I, I would imagine a lot of what you guys have got to do as part of that infrastructure team is you're responsible that you get a request that, co that comes in and you've got to be able to build out a new system, whether it's from bare metal, virtual. You've got to sit down the minimal uh, OS on it, the minimal set of packages, uh, the, the initial configurations, everything to get that thing up and running. And you've got to manage the life cycle of that system. And then you've got to hand it off to the application team. And the application team's got to come on and put on their kind of packages, their configurations, to be able to put it out into the environment. That's a fairly common scenario. So in what, uh, Justin, sh uh, sh bleh, what Justin has set up for us earlier uh, to kick this all off was he actually set up a, a set of scripts uh, to go out and actually leverage satellite to go through and build a whole series and set of systems, very similar to what you would do here to lay down the software, lay down the base OS, lay down the initial set of configurations. And the second step is to bring Ansible into the equation to be able to add all the applications on top of that. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. So first, let's actually take a look. Hey, the demo gods have shined upon us. Excellent. Um, all right, so the use case that we're going to show today is specifically a rolling update. Uh, this is a fairly standard thing that people are doing with Ansible today, and the reason is because we, we as Ansible and Ansible the tool fundamentally understand that an application is more than even just a set of configurations. Uh, what it really is, is a set of configurations that have knowledge and state of what the other pieces of the puzzle are actually doing as well. So fundamentally, in order to do a, a rolling update uh, use case with Ansible and Ansible Tower, we get that it's um, the exact flow and exact process uh, that is really the piece that needs to be automated. So in fact, that's what we're going to show today. So as Chris said, we've, we've used Satellite to deploy kind of all the base OS stuff. We've registered them in. Everything's happy-go-lucky. Um, and then what we're going to do is, in this demo that we'll, we'll dive into, um, we've deployed an actual web app, and we'll be able to go to that web app and, and show you that it uh, is, in fact, running. It's very simple. Please do not mock my JSP skills. <laughs> um, but fundamentally, we've got some rel instances. They happen to all be in Amazon. Uh, four web servers, a load balancer, a monitoring server, and a, uh, and a database server. Now, if we were going to make updates to the system, the, the question is, well, Let's say we need to reme remediate shell shock um, or uh, heart bleed, for instance. In order to do that, you have to restart services that are actually utilizing um, the OpenSSL library. Well, if I've got a live web app and I've got umpteen numbers of web servers out there and I need to remediate all of those, the last thing I want to do is, is push something out and, and just by default blow them all up because uh, that could actually cause a user impact issue. So what you need to do is start with a, a small number of these uh, and, and modify a couple, then assuming that's successful, move on to the next ones, assuming that's successful, move on to the next ones, and so forth. So that's ultimately what we're going to show today, and we're going to orchestrate this whole process, uh, and we're going to show what happens, um, not just updating some underlying packages, again, from satellite, uh, but what the actual um, deployment of a new version of the web app looks like. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and take a look. So the first thing that I'm going to do real quick here is... Um, is actually figure out what my, uh, my load balancer server is. So we'll click on this guy, we'll scroll down, we'll see this is the load balancer. Now when I fired this job off, I put a bunch of different parameters in here to, to alter how the actual playbook is run. Uh, so I won't go into all the details on all of them, but a lot of them uh, should make a fair amount of sense. I'm kind of grouping the servers because the different types of servers have different purposes and we need to treat them differently. Um, we have different ports, and so some of those ports will be what JBoss is listening on. Other ports will be what HAProxy is listening on. Um, we have the MySQL port, and that's all important because, of course, we're dynamically generating uh, IP tables firewall rule um, that is contextual based on all the members of the actual system. So this means that if I came in after the fact and added five new web servers because I had an auto-scaling event, 
those five web servers when the same role was applied. All the existing servers, nothing would happen because they're all, they're all fine, they don't need any changes, but all of the new servers would actually get um, updated firewall rules based on, you know, based on uh, the fact that there were new systems added to the cluster. So, you know, without going into all of the details, this is effectively the variables that we applied as part of this job, um, and we deployed this. So let's take a quick look at our web app. Um, yeah, see, isn't that so great? Excellent, so we'll, we'll launch that. It'll take a, a quick second to load all of that on my, on my tiny little Amazon instances. And hey, we've got version 1.0, and I could sit here and I could hit reload, and, uh, and you might see the IP address change. Um, we have the load balancer set to round robin, but sometimes it, it gets a little bit stickier than, uh, than um, we would really like. But point is, you could sit there, hit reload, and you'll eventually, you know, you'll eventually see uh, different IP addresses and, and see it picking different web servers. So now let's actually take a look at um, how we would do a rolling update of this. So I'm gonna go back to my job templates here and I'm gonna explain all of these individual pieces in a second. So let's find this one. We're gonna update the JBoss web app stack. I'm gonna launch it. It's gonna ask me a couple of questions. Uh, Ansible Tower gives you the ability to ask your end users the types of questions they would expect to understand. Um, I should also point out, this would be a great opportunity to plug for cloud forms. So if, you, if you're looking at cloud management in your environment, um, this is, um, certainly all addressable via an API as well. So these are the types of questions and types of parameters that you could easily pass from an external system, either via API or, or using something like Cloud Forms. Um, but ultimately, it's asking us how many servers uh, should we update at a single time. Um, I know I've only deployed four, so if I did that, then we would actually take our app offline. We don't wanna do that. Um, we'll split the difference, we'll say two at a time. Um, and then what version of the app is being deployed? So this is interesting in that um, this effectively could come from anywhere. Uh, I happen to know that in the, in the writing of these playbooks, I just have a simple war file that I kind of pre-built, but we could actually go to source control, grab all of that, uh, we could build it, um, we could test it before we actually attempted to deploy it, we could do all of those things. Um, alternatively, we could install another package. I mean, there are any one of a number of different ways that, uh, that you could effectively grab this. Um, so we know that we're running version 1.0. Um, let's move it to version 1.1. Now what's important about, as we launch this, if you begin to think about like all the different things that you have to take into account when you're deploying an application, um, when we're doing this update, we're calling the same roles and playbooks that we use to deploy the environment in the first place. So if one of those tasks that you had in a playbook said, you know, update these particular packages or yum update all packages, um, then that would all, that would all happen. So we would, as part of the process, first go in, uh, grab a web server, we would, as you see here, we pop into monitoring, we actually disable it out of monitoring, and then once it's actually disabled out of monitoring, then we'll pull it out of HA proxy. Once it's pulled out of HA proxy, we'll go through and, and um, reapply all of the base roles. So if there are any updates or any other packages that, that need to be perhaps updated as part of that definition, that's all encapsulated in Ansible, uh, and it's telling that, si that system, which came from satellite and is registered to satellite for content, it's gonna tell that system, yum update. And the end result of that is that it's going to put the right versions or the latest versions of those packages that are necessary, and it's gonna to continue to motor through and, and also um, push back any changes that were potentially made in those systems. So if someone came in and mucked around with the firewall rules or changed a port somewhere, it's going to, it's gonna push this system back into the desired end state that you ultimately wanted. So um, this will take uh, just a, a couple of minutes to run. Um, so let's talk a bit about some of the individual components that we're dealing with here. Uh, first and foremost, playbooks themselves, if you're not familiar with Ansible, um, all of these demos are available out of my GitHub account um, and we're easily accessible. So ansible.com slash get dash started, a uh, ton of information there. We've got booths, we've got a ton of talks and little leaflets that we we're handing out that have all those talks. But uh, the point is um, Ansible describes your environment using playbooks. It's common plain text files uh, and you can manage and track those just like you would any other, any other plain text like code files. Um, Ansible recognizes that as a project. So projects can be um, presented via source control. In this particular case, all of my conference demos are, are in Git, uh, but it could be local disk, you could pull it from Mercurial Subversion and really anything that supports those particular standards. So as we move forward, we also have the concept of an inventory. An inventory is just a collection of servers. These can be static, these can be dynamic, we can reach into cloud providers. Um, satellite in the near release will actually have a connector for 6.2 and tower so that you will be able to uh, you'll be able to actually ingest inventory from satellite directly. Um, 
but uh, we will take all of these servers, we'll group them and, and give you the ability to apply further automations from here. Um, moving forward, we also have the concept of a job template. So if you're familiar with running Ansible, you'll understand that you need a couple of things in order to run uh, an actual Ansible job. If you're on the command line, you need a playbook, you need a credential in order to uh, access that remote system, and you need an inventory. Once you have those three things together, you can actually successfully execute a playbook. Um, a job template for Ansible, is, or Ansible Tower, is exactly that. So a job template will capture uh, a number of components. It'll capture, uh, you know, name, description, job type, run, check, scan. So we can actually run these in a, a dry run mode where it will only show you uh, what it would do. It won't necessarily, or actually not even necessarily, it won't make any changes to your environment. It'll just show you what changes would be made. So that allows you to kind of doing, uh, go about doing on, um, not remediation, but it allows you to validate that your actual running configuration matches the one that you actually defined. Uh, then we give it a machine credential. So this is a, in Tower, it is, um, it is actually my, my private key that I've ingested into Tower. Uh, it is non-recoverable by standard users. It's encrypted everywhere from the database on up. Um, and uh, it's stored in a way that normal users can access it and use it if you've given them permission to do such, but they can't recover it. So this is the credential that I'm actually using to run this execution or run this job on, uh, on the target systems. Um, you can put cloud credentials in, so if I'm actually instantiating instances or maybe I'm interoperating with a, a elastic load balance or something, we, uh, we give you the mechanisms to do all of that. And then we have all of the parameters that we're entering to, to modify how it's run. Um, okay, so let's come back and take a look. And in fact, our, our job was successful. We can go down on any one of these, see you know, anything and any bit of information that we want about this. But if I were to come back over here and hit reload here, ultimately you'll see that um, when it loads, we're in version, um, we're in version 1.1. Uh, I could run the same job and pass it 1.0 and we would roll back to 1.0. Uh, I can come here and actually take a look and, and validate that indeed all of these systems are in fact registered uh, into our satellite. Um, and again, all of the packages that we're installing on these systems and all of, all of the, like, you know, the Etsy host file and whatnot are all provided via, uh, via satellite. Um, and yet we're automating and orchestrating that entire process using, uh, using Ansible. This is a slow instance. But I assure you they're there. There we go. Come on. Yahtzee. Excellent. So um, that is effectively what, um, what we have to show you. And... Summary. Well, I mean, what we, hope that you can, <laughs> what we hope that you can see from this is really the power of being able to use the two tools together for what's best. I mean, Satellite's great at being able to do the initial provisioning of the systems, doing the ongoing patch maintenance, and that type of stuff. But when now you want to architect, you know, and if all you had to do was update a single system, Satellite can do that without, without a problem. But when you get into the more complex stuff that Justin's talking about, where you've got a multi-tiered application running across multiple different systems with all different types of dependencies of different services that have got to be stopped and started, that's where you bring in a solution like Ansible, because you can orchestrate all of those things, pull all the inventory information, pull all the packages and stuff out of Satellite. So you're getting a chance to leverage both sides of it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we have a number of other sessions. Uh, if you want to talk about the satellite ones real quick. Yes, yeah, so we have a number of, of sessions. Uh, if you want to get more in depth on the satellite side, that we've got uh, uh, later on today, we've got some additional ones on integration with other products, such as uh, integration into Red Hat Enterprise virtualization. If you didn't get a chance to take a look at the lab today with uh, Satellite 6.2, the lab, they had one this morning. We've got another one uh, uh, tomorrow that's going on as well, so you can actually get hands on and see some of that integration. We talked about the inventory inter integration in Satellite 6.2 with uh, Tower would be on display there. Uh, we've got uh, d deployments uh, for transition. For those of you that are still on Satellite 5, we can go to Satellite 6. We've got a session on that uh, tomorrow. And then on Thursday, we've got Thomas Cameron, who does his always impressive uh, power user trips and ticks. Power user tips and tricks, jeez. Uh, not ticks. And then along with the, uh, the roadmap. So if you want to see where Satellite's going and an additional demonstration, we've got that as well as a birds of a feather session, uh, which you're welcome to join us at and ask any uh, additional questions. Yeah, and so um, the other thing that I'll just throw in here, um, we do, and I don't know if we have any left, but we have little accordion leaflets that have all of the Ansible sessions. Uh, I think kind of highlighting just the massive amount of interest that there is in Ansible and Ansible Tower within the community and within the, the Red Hat user base. Um, we, there I think are like 15 to 20 some odd sessions that involve Ansible here. So uh, if you want to learn more about Ansible, there's really legitimately uh, something for everyone. Uh, I myself have three, so there's this one. Um, I've got one tomorrow with a customer 
uh, talking about how they implemented DevOps using Ansible and how they kind of transformed their environment. Very cool, very uh, entertaining. Uh, and then we've got um, how, to do uh, how to do DevOps without leaving your traditional or legacy environment behind. That one is midday Thursday. He's very much an overachiever doing three sessions. <laughs> Very much. I was like, I'm still kicking myself for doing three, but uh, it'll, it'll be good. Um, and then the last thing I would say is that from a uh, services perspective, we have um, an actual session that you can sit down with an actual automation architect who has implemented all kinds of, of automation solutions using Ansible, big and small. Um, this information session or the discovery session is happening tomorrow. Uh, and I think it's right out in, in the lobby up here, there's a, big, there's a big session. So if you want to sit down and actually ask some really uh, in-depth uh, and probing questions about, about how some of this stuff works, he's a, uh, he's a great resource. Very good. And again, what we hope you would take away from this, we'll take some time for questions in a moment, but what we'd hope you'd take away from this, it's very much a choice. So again, from the satellite perspective moving forward, we'll continue to support everything that we do today on the Puppet side, we'll continue to support that, but if you want to take a leverage of the Ansible side, we'll have that integration moving forward. You'll see some of that start to come out in 6.2 and then also in 6.3 moving forward, you'll see additional types of integration with Ansible as well. So with that, we'll open it up to any questions. Back there. A little louder. Yeah, so fundamentally, uh, there are a number of different things that a lot of organizations are using to, to accomplish things like that. Uh, you have, certainly Ansible could be a, a source of that. Um, more likely than not, you might have a CMDB of some variety that is the ultimate source of truth. So I think, you know, when you start to look at things like CloudForm, Satellite, and Satellite clearly is going to know about all of your REL infrastructure, but probably not your Windows. Uh, Ansible could potentially know about all of it, but if some of it's vert, some of it's physical, you might very well have a CMDB somewhere. So you know, ultimately, we're not going to tell you a single way to do it. We're going to present you with a number of different choices that you can make to understand uh, ultimately where that source of truth lies. But we would argue, I think, fundamentally, um, whether or not you choose to implement a single source of truth, having a number of things that can dynamically generate that source on the fly ends up being a pretty powerful solution because it ensures that, let's say you do need to remediate something, you want to capture 100% of your inventory 100% of the time, being able to go in and dynamically generate that at runtime uh, from, you know, by pulling inventories from various tools ends up being a whole lot more powerful than even trusting something like a CMDB that perhaps gets, gets out of whack pretty quickly. Yeah, and I mean, we actually have a, uh, we have a Puppet module, so we can control the Puppet agent, um, deploy it, start it, uh, and effectively manage what it does uh, from an automation perspective, an orchestration perspective, so that's why we say it really is an and. You know, yeah. There are some things that Puppet's really good at, uh, and we'll, we're happy to orchestrate that. Mm -hmm. So my question is, so, so if we introduce, we introduce a, new, a new version software, so that means do we have to put all our uh, new build binary to the sa satellite so that we can control that workflow from that uh, uh, ANSI power so we can get that uh, binary from the uh, uh, satellite and deploy it to all my servers, optimize it faster. So my question is, Uh, so, no, functionally not necessary. Uh, you could certainly choose to do that. You could build it as an RPM, and we have a number of customers that do just that, and then you can manage that package and easily deploy it. And whether you do that uh, via Ansible or, um, or just via satellite, it doesn't particularly matter. But uh, it, certainly with Ansible, you do have the choice of grabbing that, uh, that binary from wherever you might choose. 
So you could get it from, uh, from Git or another source control system. Uh, you could actually pull it down first to the satellite server, do any build that you, ne you needed, uh, and then grab that artifact from somewhere and push it out. So you have a number of different choices to how to do it. That, well, so you know, um, I, I don't know. Are you, are you saying that the app is running on top of? Right. It's running on top of RHEL, or what's the app running on top of? Right. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know that there's a single best practice for that. There are certainly wrong ways to do it, but ultimately, it, 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 a lot of it depends on, on how, you know, and really how you need it to work and what you need it to do. I think it's a, combina it's a combination of the tools. Yeah. I'd argue it's also a combination of the process and the procedures that you have in place of who has access to it. Because what I find a lot of times the customers that I talk to, that decision gets dictated by access control more, more than anything else. Yeah, you can just, yeah. Absolutely. So at this point, the strategy is that they will remain separate They're separate products. products. They'll, they'll continue to be separate products that have integration between them. Yeah, yeah there'll be integration, you know, potentially underneath the hood with the APIs and stuff. Was that, was that your question? Okay. okay. Yeah, sure, great question. So we have a number of large customers that are actually solely Windows. And in some cases, the only uh, Linux they have in the environment are the control nodes for Ansible. Uh, and the host for or the server for Ansible Tower. Uh, we, and I like to, to talk about this because it shows the overall velocity of the community. Uh, we started with, uh, when I started um, at Ansible about two years ago now, uh, we had three Windows modules. Uh, we now have well north of 30 plus a ton of Azure modules. Uh, and we're tightly ingrained in working with Microsoft to continue to build out that capability. Uh, so right now, I would venture a guess that you can likely accomplish anything that you would need to from a Windows perspective. Certainly all of the basic use cases of I need to enable or disable a service, I need to install packages, I need to push files, uh, change configurations, et cetera, all of those are well supported today. Uh, and I think down the road, um, you know, not a future looking statement, but you know, the, the community has been pretty open about saying that we want, you know, we want SQL Server modules, we want uh, perhaps other modules that allow you to more easily deploy and manage uh, SharePoint. Um, so I think that there's a lot more that we could be doing in the Microsoft ecosystem. And the good news is, especially with the, the, the Red Hat uh, Microsoft Alliance, that you know, there are a lot of announcements this week about that, uh, of things coming down the pipe. I mean, we're in a good position to be able to accomplish that. I thought I saw one more hand over here. Maybe that was the, the same question. Do you have a question in the front? Yeah, so not today. Uh, I mean, I could show you uh, since we're just pulling it from GitHub, but um, no, in today's version, we, we just show you what the actual file is. We have some, uh, some features in the pipeline that will, will make that a little bit more rich so that you can actually see specifically the content of the playbook that was run versus just the name. Uh -huh. I was waiting for it. <laughs> awesome. Uh, yeah, we're absolutely going to do that. I mean, it's, it's Red Hat's position that uh, we are an open source company. Uh, so yes, yes, Ansible Tower will be open source. I can't give you an exact idea on time frame, but uh, the answer is a definitive and absolute yes. Mm 
that's on your side. Well, no, <laughs> I already got the agent. Well, yeah. So, so they're, they're, like, it's really so it's a two-part question. First and foremost, from an Ansible perspective, no, we don't have any immediate plans to uh, to provide any kind of agent. Um, what we there are mechanisms that we can use to accomplish like effectively local run, and you could very well create. Uh, Create some local stuff that would that would work in more of a pool mechanism. I think there's a project out there called Ansible Pool. Yeah. So, um, but that being said, uh, there are other things, and we, you know, and certainly a lot of government environments see scenarios where having a reach in is a problem. And I remember from the earlier days of satellite, even some of those scenarios where we were trying to do push activity was a problem. So we, yeah. you know, you guys created the all the OSAD stuff originally, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, which uh, which is fun. But the the point in that is that uh, there are other things architecturally that we could perhaps talk about. Um, I mean, we support bash and host, we support jump host. There are a number of, of things like that that could be done. Um, there are some later versions and architectures of tower that may actually move the execution of the Ansible job into various enclaves, and that would have a single system that would reach back out. So that's, that's a potential option. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'd love to, to chat more about how we could potentially solve that problem for you. Go ahead. Yep, yep. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's a fairly common use case that we see pretty frequently. I mean, we understand. Uh, I mean, it, ultimately, there are a lot of choices to be made, um, and just because you are an, a large existing puppet shop does not mean that that you can't use Ansible. Clearly, uh, I mean, functionally, again, Puppet's a great config manager. Uh, so if you've defined and you have a lot of IP built into your puppet environment, sure, automate it uh, and orchestrate it with Ansible, no problem. Uh, yeah, and that's that it. is, that's, we have a number of customers, large customers even, that, uh, that are doing just that with Ansible. So they, they absolutely have an and strategy. Yeah, and I see the same thing on the satellite side while I walk into a customer and they've made an investment in Puppet either, either through satellite or the community vision or Puppet Enterprise. They've got skills, they've got people, they've got modules, process. They want to leverage all that, but then they look, they look at the automation side and say, wow, this stuff is just so much easier with Ansible and they'll put both of them together. So it's very, very common. Yeah, and often in, um, they, in large puppet shops, they tend to already be doing a lot of, uh, a lot of scripting to kind of glue some of these pieces together. And that's, that right there is, is usually the first use case that people tackle with Ansible. Say, so look, you know, the, script is, the scripts are brittle. Um, there's like one guy or gal that maintains them. They're a challenge. So, hey, let's automate that little piece with Ansible. And they ultimately will kind of grow the automation in that environment. But yeah, there's no, no requirement to replace all of the IP that you've, that you've already built. I think we had a question down here. Pretty, pretty snowflake. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's good, good, good feedback. Did you hear that, Jason? Excellent. We have another one back here. Right. Yeah, and that's what we're looking at the future versions of satellite is to, is to give you that choice to go either the puppet side or go to the Ansible side based on what, what, what's best for you. 
Excellent. And then there was. Uh, can I scroll below the stack? So uh, it can. Yeah. yeah it, um, we require Python. Uh, IBM does not ship Python. So if you actually go to their, um, if you go to their support portal, they point you to some community guy who built a Python library. Uh, we've seen it work fairly well. Not all modules will work, but uh, you know we've seen a number of folks that have gotten, you know, are they're able to accomplish what it is that they seek to do. Question. So, so the so the satellite subscription includes includes Puppet today for the the use cases that Puppet can I'm sorry the use cases that satellite can support, and moving in the future we'll add in the Ansible support as well. Now that's Ansible from a I guess I'd say from a satellite perspective of how it's configuring the systems. If you want to do more of the playbook management and stuff, the Ansible Tower would provide, and that would that would require you to purchase a Tower subscription. I think Justin, you talked a little bit about how Ansible is really kind of two parts. There's kind of the core component mm -hmm. and there's the tower component. The core piece is what we'll use in, in parts of satellite. All the stuff that comes from tower would be a separate subscription for managing those playbooks and stuff. Yeah, so I think it's an important uh, delineation to make that the Ansible component within satellite will allow you to do system configuration. So the existing, yeah. uh, the existing uh, use cases as defined by the satellite team will all be accomplishable with Ansible as well. If you begin to orchestrate and automate, then that is, that is a, a larger Ansible story than just what necessarily satellite will provide. I mean, generally speaking, when you take a look at satellite, if you're trying to do everything on a single system, you're trying to automate or work with tasks that are on a single system, satellite does that really well. Where Ansible really has the strength is when you start getting into the applications, multi-tier, across multiple types of systems, lots of dependencies on services and that kind of stuff. That's Network really devices. Ansible. Yeah, that's really where Ansible really, really shines. Yeah, the, so the, there is no, curr yeah, currently there's no, uh, there's no subscription available for just Ansible Core uh, or Ansible Open Source. Um, Ansible Tower is the, is the go-to-market today. Uh, we're still working through exactly how, how it's going to do that. I mean, the, the, I would say that the integration is that we will leverage things out of core to make, to make some of the configuration management tasks actually run, but then we'll have separate integration that goes to tower yep. for other types of things. So it'll be, it'll be, on, it'll be on both pieces. Uh, we're looking at, we'll, we'll, have, we'll have parts of that integration actually start with 6.2, which is like the inventory information to tower. Mm -hmm. 6.3, uh, which will come out likely the early part of next year, we'll start to have some, of, uh, have some Ansible core elements in it for configuration management, and then, so that's when it'll start. And then we'll just keep you know, adding on in future releases. Awesome. Great questions, great questions. Well, if you have any other questions or anything, Justin and I'll be up here in the front of the room. Thank you very much. <laughs>